So I'm going to call to order the meeting of April 6, 2020. And can I get a roll call, please? Yes. Chair Moore? Here. Vice Chair McKinney? Here. Commissioner Hancock? Yeah. Commissioner Onines? Here. Commissioner Lemus? Here. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to item C, approval of the minutes. Does anyone like to make any? I don't think we had minutes, actually. I didn't see any minutes. <coughs> Nor I. No. So, Lauren, I, I, the minutes didn't come through for the, for the fall, last meeting? All right, we'll go ahead and move forward, and I'm okay. make sure those attached to the next meeting. All right, no worries. Um, any changes to the agenda? Lauren? I'm sorry, no, there are no changes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go on to item E, oral and written communication. The public is asked to please, I would say, submit um, <laughs> your name and address for the record. And please limit your comments to items not already agendized for discussion. Okay, and so we will move over to the attendee side. Okay, I'm gonna go down the list here and uh, Ms. Alderman, would you like to speak? Hi, um, I wanted to check on the um, whether the view, view the development sorry I'm having trouble talking the development project is that going to all go through even though you know we've got such an uncertain future and um, it just seems not a great time and the other thing is why are you guys going doing an economic development plan during a pandemic pandemic it just doesn't seem very um, um, very good time to be doing these things um, I'm glad though to hear and everything that everything's going on fine as uh, with this webcast okay thank you that's it thank you Lori okay the next on the list is last phone number digits are 2167. I don't have a name for that caller. If you'd like to go ahead. Uh, my name is Robert Nissenbaum. Um, I'm on the call because I'm actually the property owner uh, of the foreshed development properties. So I'm just here to basically observe um, for now unless something comes up that I need to participate. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, next caller, last four digits are 1680. Would you like to speak? Uh, no, fine. I'm just uh, here to answer any questions. I'm uh, one of the applicants. Thank you. Great, thank you. I see City Manager Ovid. Would you like to speak on an item? Okay. Moving on, I see uh, Miss Jenny Blaker. Would you like to speak on an item? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Um, at the moment, no, I'm not wanting to speak on an item. Maybe when it comes up I might, but not right now. Thank you. Okay, next I see Lorianne Barber. I'm here just to uh, observe the meeting, so to speak. Great, thank you. Uh, 
and Olivia Irvin. Hi there, I am available for item F uh, should any questions come up on the environmental piece. I will stand by. Thank you. Okay, Chair Moore, I believe that is it for attendees. All right, great. So that was oral and written communication. I'm moving on to matters at hand. So we'll move on to item F. And this is consideration of approval of preliminary design review for the Plaza View mixed use development project located 8160 La Plaza and 120 and 128 East Katati Avenue. Um, do we have a staff report? Yes, Jamie Gary. Staff report, JP. Did you hear anything I said? No. Oh, okay. Sorry, I must have been muted. Okay. Um, for the record, my name is JP Harris. I'm a senior planner with the city of Katati. And the item that we're talking about begins on package page five. And, and the item is actually two applications that were submitted together. Um, or two separate applicants. Um, they are two buildings, two two-story two mixed-use buildings. Building one, uh, for lack of a better word, is the one that's located at the corner of La Plaza and East Katati Avenue, and building two is located at Charles Street and East Katati Avenue. The first building, building one, and actually, Lauren, can you start my PowerPoint? Yeah. Thank you. Um, if you look at this, is a, a, a rendering of a view of the building as viewed from Arthur Street, looking uh, to the southwest. Uh, this is that building would be located at what is currently vacant land between Charles Street and La Plaza, fronting on East Katati there. And now there's two buildings. One is that located at the corner of uh, Charles Street, and the other one is located at the corner of La Plaza. So the building one, which is the building located at the corner of La Plaza and East Katati, is a two-story building. And it has approximately 6,992 square feet of commercial floor area on the bottom floor and six residential units on the top floor, five two-bedroom and one one-bedroom. The building itself is approximately 30 feet in height. That's the main frontage of the building, and then the towers ex extend up to just shy of 40 feet. Also included with the building is, and why don't you move forward a little bit? Oh, wait, can you give me, I'm gonna have request remote control. They're not working. All right, you should have a JP. Okay, there, I got it. Thank you. Um, uh, so this is the picture of the building. So also it has 40 spaces, parking spaces in the rear. It has solar, which will be located along... Sorry about that. Uh, along uh, the, the parking structures and the, the trash enclosure, we're currently there's uh, power lines that run along East Katati Avenue. Those will be undergrounded, and um, also the parking lot itself will include EV chargers as well. And um, I do want to believe Henry's on the call, and Henry is 
going to give a, also going to give a presentation today. So I'm going to try to abbreviate my presentation and let him really talk about the architecture. So this is an area of uh, where this project is located. It's the, those two lots combined create this kind of um, uh, funky, one's triangular, one's a little bit uh, uh, rectangular-ish, but uh, uh, it's right in this area here. And this is a site plan of the two buildings, building one here on the plaza, building two over here along the corner of Charles and East Katati, and then the, the parking area with ingress and egress uh, at both at East Katati and Charles Street. I will mention that uh, because of safety concerns coming this way and congestion this way, we're limiting it so only right turns out of the property. So if someone wanted to go uh, this direction, let's say they wanted to go out to Old Redwood Highway, they would have to exit the property come this way and then come connect over to Old Red. They wouldn't, this turn would be prohibited. And these are the subject parcels. Building one is, is on these two parcels, and building two is over on this parcel. And just for a little bit of background, this project is located within the downtown specific plan. And um, so far, the, the city council has really, excuse me, the planning commission has really only dealt with one other major project in the downtown specific plan area, and that was the Katati Hotel. Um, <clears throat> this will be the second project, so it's a significant project and also with the, at a fairly prominent and significant location. The site itself has been uh, vacant since 1965. Um, at that point, it was developed with a single family dwelling, and that was demolished then. And we have no record of anything being on the site since. Um, and like I said, it was, uh, it is included within the downtown specific plan. This was a plan that was adopted in 2009. And um, the plan explicitly calls for a two-story mixed-use development uh, in this area. And then the general plan came out in 2015, which also reiterates those DSP goals. So with respect to the project, the project first came in, um, in 2017, they had some meetings with the former director, uh, Director Parker, and also they submitted a conceptual plan review application. Um, that plan review was taken to the design review committee, which uh, had the general favorable opinion of the project. They thought it was a good design on a very challenging site to develop because of the shapes. Um, they did make some recommendations and that is they had asked uh, the applicants to reduce the distance between the buildings to create greater frontage along East Katati Avenue. Uh, as well, they wanted to minimize parking lot visibility. Uh, there was a starkness about the building, especially the southern facade that they wanted addressed, um, which they did in this application. They, the, the, when it came in for com, uh, conceptual plan review, the Rear commercial doors were single wide, and the, the committee felt those should be double wide uh, based on experience for, for loading and unloading into those commercial spaces. And they wanted to make sure that the project would accommodate outdoor dining, uh, which it would, especially along the plaza. And then um, I'm not going to belabor the downtown specific plan here, because I know Henry is going to talk about it as well. Uh, but the, the idea for this area was um, for, for reinvestment and like revitalization of the downtown historic area. And there's four distinct planning uh, areas. Pardon me? In the north, there's the Northern Gateway. And then this is area here is uh, considered, a, excuse me, this is the Commerce Avenue area. Okay. And then we're in the, yeah. this particular project, La, La 
Plaza District. And I'm gonna look. This one here is uh, the civic identity for the down for the uh, La Plaza. Is the focus is on civic identity, um, uh, it, which talks about continual enhancement of La Plaza Park, along with developing this into basically rejoining the park so that the uh, the roads don't cut through it. And then this is the area right here where this project would be. Some of the other uh, elements that they're trying to achieve is enhance the public parking, enhance bike and ped circulation, and then more applicable to this project, reactivate the hub with housing and office above commercial. And this project includes uh, commercial on the ground floor and housing above. And it has a max development height of 35 feet. Like I said before, this building is 30 feet. Um, you are allowed to go eight feet above the maximum height for things such as towers or cupolas or architectural features. So at 40 feet for the tower height, they are within this standard, which would allow up to 38 feet for the towers. And then just quickly, we the fairly robust environmental investigation into this, even though it was exempt. Uh, that's pretty well discussed thoroughly on packet pages 58 through 104. Um, but I'll just quickly run through it. It has a general plan community plan exemption. Uh, this is done, this is allowed by CEQA guidelines section 15183 because it is consistent with the general plan and it is consistent with the downtown specific plan densities and the previous EIR. The project is also consistent with two prior uh, former EIRs, programmatic EIRs. Those are the general plan EIR and the downtown specific plan EIR. It also has another exemption or streamlined review because it's uh, consistent with a specific plan EIR. And then there's, uh, it's also considered an infill project, which uh, allows it to fall under an infill exemption. And then tonight, we're going to be recommending that you move to adopt a resolution approving design review for mixed use building one and, uh, and the associated improvements at 8170 La Plaza. And we'll also ask you to move to adopt the second resolution for building two. Um, at 128 East Katati Avenue. And I do have a slight change to the resolution title only on uh, page 128. Um, it says in the title, approving preliminary di design review for a new two-story mixed-use building consisting of six residential units and it says 6,992 square feet of commercial space. That should read 7,162 square feet of commercial space. The recitals are fine. It's just wrong in the title. We want to make sure we have capture that correction. And then with that, I think I will close and definitely remain available for questions. But I do want to turn it over to Henry, who can talk more about his project. Thank you, JP. Can I have the applicant like to speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name's Henry Wicks, Wicks Architecture. Uh, I appreciate uh, the ability to um, put this meeting together, and I, um, in, in these interesting times, I, I um, applaud you all for spending an evening, um, even though you may be in a different surrounding, I, uh, I'm glad we've been able to come together and try to move something forward, and I, and I believe this project is something that would uh, be worthy of the downtown Katati and, and uh, moving it forward. So I've, I've got a little bit of a presentation. If uh, Lauren, you could uh, pull that up and I'll 
request some control to walk you through the package? Yeah, just one moment. Apologies. I would have I would have come around and introduced myself to each of uh, each of the commissioners and and, uh, and as well as you, uh, uh, Chairman Moore. Uh, so that's fine. I, I, we're all just learning this new way of uh, of doing meetings. So yeah. I I again I really appreciate uh, the, we have this opportunity to move this move this forward tonight and. Um, learning experience for me. I've never done a presentation uh, from a virtual environment like this. Um, while, while Lauren's pulling it up, let me qualify myself a little bit. I'm, I started Wix Architecture. Uh, we're celebrating our 25th year uh, as of October of 2019. Uh, I medium, small firm. We do pretty much every project type except for public works type type projects and uh, nothing over four stories in, in building height. Um, we do primarily commercial work, um, uh, lots of interior tenant improvements. I've probably done over a million square feet and that's not an exaggeration. Um, in the 25 years, um, we've done um, the Whole Foods in Cottingtown. Uh, we did a, a mixed use project four story in downtown Santa Rosa. Uh, at, at 615 Hillsburg Avenue, uh, very successful. They've got a zero, uh, typically run at a zero occupancy rate. So um, good experience in this project type. As Hi, Papa. Okay. There we go. There we go. Um, I'm also a, uh, a designer view board. Uh, member on the city of Santa Rosa's designer view board appointed by John Sawyer. Um, so um, that's a little bit of my way of like you guys of giving back to the community. So, oh, Station. This this would be the La Plaza Park area, the downtown historic portion of the downtown specific plan, and this these are our two buildings that we're proposing. This is La Plaza, obviously East Katati, and this is Charles Street. Uh, this is this is currently how it sits as um, three vacant parcels. The this is a large kind of triangular shaped parcel, and then these two parcels we would combine to create. Um, additional building or uh, one building site for building one. This would be on building two. Um, some of the project highlights: um, two two mixed use buildings on three vacant parcels that I just showed you. Um, Fifteen thousand square feet of retail and commercial space. Uh, Twelve apartments ranging in uh, one, two, and three bedrooms. There. All pretty unique designs, given the odd shapes of the buildings. We we don't have the typical formula: um, two bedroom, three bedrooms. Building one has a couple of duplications, but almost all uh, eight of the twelve are unique, uh, custom designed uh, apartment units. Um, the parking is at the in behind tucked behind the buildings. Um, we've got uh, solar panel systems on the carports. That would uh, cover uh, some of the some of the parking on the south and west sides of the respective lots. Um, 
as well as the roofs, as much as the roof that we're not using for mechanical uh, heating and air conditioning units, we'll pack that with solar panels as well. Uh, as JP mentioned, there's some um, electrical PG&E lines that run along East Katati, running our entire frontage that will underground, and then also as part of that have to reconnect to the uh, uh, neighboring uh, units on the north side of East Katati. So it's a big, it's a big undertaking. Um, in addition to recycling, normal recycling systems, we're going to offer, also offer composting systems that uh, we're working with Recology as one of our um, people on this project. Um, On-site water retention systems, both above ground and underground, given the limited amount of site, size of the site, we've had to do some underground re water retention as, as in addition to the above ground. Uh, retention ponds that show on the landscaping plans. Um, those landscape plans are utilizing the best technology that we have available to use uh, drought tolerant plants and, and landscaping. Um, we're also um, both street frontages along La Plaza and East Katati were required to use certain street trees at a certain spacing and we've yet met those uh, guidelines. The downtown specific plan is, is one of the big driving components in, of both our design and what we're allowed to do on this project. As JP mentioned, we started this in uh, uh, late around November 2016 and our first filing applications with, uh, with Vicki Parker were in, in 2017. And just so you know, any, anybody that's familiar with development, there's, there's a lot more to, to us uh, coming up with a good design and uh, meeting our clients' needs and then presenting it to the city. We, we did the concept design review and then um, not necessarily to any of these orders in particular, but we had to do a traffic study, um, Tiger Salamander study because the site was undeveloped and uh, raw land. Um, many site environmental studies from different perspectives, a historical resource study, um, grading and improvement plans, as well as our architectural design plans and the landscape plans that uh, are wrapped up into the packets that you've received. Pulling back from that opening shot, this is on um, La Plaza, kind of near the, um, more near the fire station looking to the, to the southeast. Uh, I'll get into what what, what and how we came up with this design, but it's a blend of the commercial block style and the mission revival style. And uh, focusing in on that, we've got a, a tower element that anchors the the corner uh, on the corner of La Plaza and East Katati. And some of the design elements are the balconies of, for the apartments, the uh, mansard roofs, and uh, the canopies covering our storefront. And the DSP governs that we have a certain amount of uh, glass and and have a, uh, a bulkhead below that, that glass and the glass doesn't go all the way down to the ground. Um, we've got a, a materials are a stucco system with um, cornicing and relief moldings, metal roofing and and tile. And the, the tile is uh, better represented in this picture, although I wish we were beating so I could actually show you the physical materials, but um, high-end, nice quality materials that that will last and hopefully stand up the, the test of time. Uh, this is back to the, this is Charles Street and looking to the southwest. And uh, we tried to close this gap between the two buildings for the uh, initial design, concept design review, which I think we've done a real good job and really hidden the parking behind the behind the buildings. Very similar detailing to both buildings. They carry over colors, materials, um, looks in general. Um, in this particular project, we had to do an exterior staircase, and that would be, uh, this is representing some vines that would cover and grow up on a, uh, a, la a metal latticing material. Um, We've, we've stayed, um, 
uh, if I had some street sections, I could show you. I'd, I'd show you that the, the DSP is driving some of these street frontages to have fairly deep sidewalks, and we've got 12 foot deep sidewalks running the entire length of East Katadi. So, real comfortable for pedestrians to walk and and um, allow for some indoor outdoor activities um, from the tenants, and then it's even wider on the Plaza Street. Uh, but we've also set it up, and I'll get to it, uh, to the Plaza Street, according to the DSP, will, will change over time. Little couple of historic photos that we found in some of our research. This is uh, circa 1950s, and, and other than that one house, the, the lots have been vacant for a long time. Although, if you look at a um, 1890s uh, AP map, you can see it was parceled out. And there, there may have been many homes on it at, at one time. Um, this is this is straight out of the DSP where this is the existing current configuration and, and as you all know about the plaza it's all it, it's cut up and we're showing you the three different alternatives in the DSP to to unify those uh, unify the the La Plaza Park back into uh, one semi-cohesive element and in all of these block diagrams you can see this is this is where our project would be in, in all three of those and we're we're trying to meet the height and the massing that's that's all directed by us in the DSP plan. And in plan view we would be sitting here in this alternative and this this area here and this area here. Again this is this is uh, one option that's uh, that has La Plaza Park reunified. Um, this shows this shows the circulation, and one of the one of the reasons why I wanted to show you this was the La Plaza Street is planned to have uh, back end diagonal parking similar to what they have up in Windsor, and two lanes and and no parking on well, excuse me, parallel parking on the other side. This this is a um, a plan view of how that parking would be achieved and uh, has a nice calming measure to it, but. Our project again. We we set the project back to this line rather than the uh, current uh, property line setbacks. Um, commercial um, co the commercial block form was was what was uh, driving our part of our design, but also part of our adherence to the DSP. And this is. In that La Plaza zone, that is what is required with uh, two examples of, of shop fronts. And I, you know, kind of picked up on some of the elements on the left hand side of the building where it starts to strike to a uh, tower corner anchoring element, and the one on the right has, has more of a just a, a facade facet change to it. Um, fairly long notes, and we, we wanted to change it up a little bit more from that. So. What we did was we took the Main Street commercial style and blended it with the Mission Revival style. And uh, appreciate um, JP picking that up in his long staff report. Hopefully you've all read that. And what we did was take took a, the 25 foot wide um, proportions, two story, and mixed it with the revival um, element and the. Mission Revival, we used the answered roofs that are in that, and then also the heavy anchoring of the tower element. And uh, hopefully you see it the same way, and we've, we've blended the two nicely together. And I'd uh, like to thank you for your consideration and, and again, your service to the community and uh, making yourselves available this evening. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about the project. All right, so this is where it's going to get a little tricky. <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to go down and do a, a kind of a roll call type thing of who has questions. So I think I'm just going to start with, um, I think I'm going to bear with me here. I think I'm just going to start with Neil. Yes. 
Hi, okay, I think I'm on there. Since I live, I'm going to recuse myself from any questions since I live within um, 500 square feet, 500 feet of it. So okay. I, won't, I won't be asking any questions on this project. Okay. Then I will go to, um, I mean, I'll go to Steve. Steve? Am I not? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I am generally in favor of this development. I uh, approve of the all. Oh, my only question, and this was probably to staff, uh, I'm, my only concern was the mixed residential commercial use. I think we only have one example of that in our city, and that's along Old Red. I wonder if we've had any experience with vacancy rates or any issues with that mixed use. All right. Well, right now we're just taking some questions from the applicant, if he has any. But we'll, I'll put that for um, staff. Okay. My apologies. No, 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 no worries. It's it's a whole new world here. Um, all right. Is anything else, Steve? No, sir. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Brittany, do you have anything? I don't have any questions for the applicant. I'm going to hold my comments um, until we can provide some more feedback to staff. Okay. And then, Sylvia, do you have any questions for the applicant? Um, I have questions about traffic and planning. Does that go to staff or to the applicant? Um, probably to staff right okay. now. Okay, then I'll hold my question, but I do like the whole design and all the information they provided, um, so I do like the project. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks. So thank you for the, um, thank you, Henry, for the presentation. Do we um, like, do you have any questions of, now we can have some questions of staff. Um, Steve had one about mixed residential commercial use. Do we know um, any um, vacancy rates? I don't know the specific vacancy rates. Um, as he's speaking of Frog Song over there. It's our mm -hmm. other two-story um, mixed-use development. Um, they've had some tenants that have been in there a long time, and they've also had some where there's been some turnover. I would say that they're nothing, it's not unusual from anything else that we're seeing with respect to uh, retail space in the city. Okay. So I'm going to kind of go down the line. These are questions of staff now. So, um, Steve, do you have anything else for staff? I have no further questions for staff. Thank you. Okay. Brittany? Um, Lisa, I'm not sure. It's not really a question. It's just kind of more my, my feedback on on the presentation and what we're doing before I, I vote on it. So is this is now a good time or should I hold off? You, you, we'll just do questions to staff right now and then I'll open it up for public comment and then we'll bring it back and if we have any questions more and then we can discuss it. Okay. All right. Sylvia, do you have anything? Yes, I did have a question on, on the packet page 94 and 95. There's references to traffic planning and um, moving the bus shelter and putting bicycle lanes and restriping. And I was just a little concerned because there was recently two left turn turn lanes going from Old Redwood Highway to East Katati Avenue. And it feels like um, in that turn, there's a lot of merging that happens. So I don't know if that barrier that's in the middle is going to be removed to extend that, to make room for that. Because I feel like with um, the bus shelter and um, extending the sidewalk, and I think I even saw something about parking along East Katani, that that's going to really um, impact that. So I was just wanted to ask questions about that. Sure, thank you. Yeah, there has been a lot of changes to that uh, whole uh, street frontage area, and they, they happened while this application was under review. Um, one of the changes that you first mentioned is the bus stop is being relocated from La Plaza, where it kind of where it's near the intersection of La Plaza and East Katari, and it's just being moved down to East Katari. So we spent a lot, a lot of time with the Sonoma County uh, Transit um, 
group and determine where would be the best location. And that was the spot that they really wanted to see that bus location at. Um, though that still doesn't reduce the fact that there's activity. So one of the conditions of approval that came from engineering department, that, which came after the roadway changes, is there used to be parking proposed along the frontage of East Katati. And what we're looking at now is actually removing the parking along East Katati, and that's what the engine, engineering department wants to do. And then we would move the bike lane closer to the, um, to the, it would basically come right up to the curb so that you wouldn't have that parking area. The, the feeling is from the engineering is that there's just too much activity happening right in that area. So those are some of the changes that you will see out there. Um, when that restriping would happen, I'm not exactly sure. That's really up to engineering when they want to reduce, remove that, but um, that's the plan right now. Let me, let me know if that answered your question. If not, I, I'll be happy to clarify. No, yes, it does, because when I first read, like I said, page uh, 9495, I was concerned about, it seemed like there was going to be a lot of congestion, but if they remove the parking, um, it looks like they're already working on it. So thank you very much. Sure. Do you have anything else, Sylvia? All right, I had a couple questions of staff. Um, so I just, um, when I was looking through this, are all of these going to be rentals? Currently, that's the proposal. Okay. There's and no, no subdivision proposed as part of this, yeah. Okay. And then um, I noticed that there's only three EV chargers. Is the infrastructure Correct. being put in to have more if they need them? Henry, do you, do you want, Henry, do you want to answer that question? I'm aware of only of the three. Um, yeah, no, we would we would uh, put more in. We'd probably put more in at the covered uh, parking area. Would make make the most sense to me because those are designated for the residential units. Okay, I'm just curious: is the infrastructure going to go in that they can be put in fairly easily after? Um, yes. Okay. It, and it, can I can I respond to the the one comment about the parking along East Katati? Sure. Mm -hmm. Just my own planner um, perspective, and and being a frequent shopper at the Oliver's in 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 Windsor, um, that that's Old Redwood Highway, and it's a fairly traveled um, road. And um, if you haven't seen it, I might suggest you take a take a drive up and and look at, at how they've done that. And the and the road's fairly narrow with the backup parking, which you want to have a little bit of traffic calming. And if you take away that parking, it's really just going to encourage people to s speed up after they get from Redwood Highway onto East, East Katahdi. And I think the vision of the downtown specific plan is to have some traffic calming in that area and get people to slow down a little bit. So just, that's my two cents worth that I, that I wanted to voice. Thank you. Does anybody have any more questions of staff? If not, we're going to open this up for public hearing. Okay, Chair Moore, I'm going to go ahead and start with the attendees that have raised their hand. And I see Ms. Blaker, if you would like to go ahead and make a comment. Jenny, are you on? We can come back to Jenny. That would be great, yeah. Okay. We'll move down to Ms. Alderman. Hi. Um, 
I had a couple of comments. I wasn't sure, but it looked like in front of the firehouse you have, in the design, across from the firehouse you have a right turn lane only, and it's already very congested with the left hand turn onto Old Redwood Highway. How is that all going to work with the firehouse? And how much have you consulted with the firehouse? Because I, for one, know what one minute of fire response means, and will it impact them? And have you made plans for, during the time that the construction, that it doesn't affect the firehouse? The other thing is on the parking, on the on-site parking, will it be for the tenants and the shoppers only, or will it be open to everybody? That's my comment. Thanks. Apologies. I am now unmuted. Chair Moore, moving on. Jenny Blaker, if you can hear us, you can go ahead and speak your public comment. Jenny, can you hear us? I can hear you, but can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. I also had questions about traffic and bicycle lanes. It's on both East Katani Avenue and Charles Street. And I was wondering what the width of the bike lane would be, what the green striping in the bike lane, and also looking at the pedestrian crossing over East Katani Avenue between Charles Street and Arthur Street. That's quite a dangerous crossing as it is already, and there are no flashing lights, no overhead flashing lights. Anything that could help make that pedestrian crossing more visible would be good, because as cars travel east on East Katani from Old Redwood Highway, there's already a lot going on with two lanes of traffic merging into one, and it would be good to have something that would slow cars down at that pedestrian crossing and make it more visible. So just more questions about pedestrian safety, bike lanes, green striping, and the lights crossing there to add to the previous questions about traffic. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. I see Lori Ann Barber. You have your hand raised. Go ahead and speak your public comment. Okay. I think I'm already muted. Is that right? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Lori. Okay, great. Thank you. So just a couple of comments and a question. I mean, overall, I think the project looks very nice. I kind of love vacant lots around, so I'm always sad to see them go away, but I understand the value of infill projects, so that's good. I want to second what Jenny said about the crossing at Charles Street. I was almost hit by a car a while ago when I was just crossing, so that is a real something. Anyway, that is a dangerous intersection currently in Katahdi. I have a question. I haven't been on that site in quite a while, but sorry, my computer is chirping at me. Remember a big, beautiful oak tree, and I don't know whether it's actually on that property or adjacent, but if it's on that property, I wonder if it's going to be able to stay. And I also wanted to briefly just comment as a resident of Frog Song 
that we have at times had issues with vacancies, and I do have some concern about how about more commercial space in Katahdi. I think at times there have been a lot of vacancies around town, and um, so I do have some concerns about adding more commercial property. And um, as someone who actually lives above the commercial area, I would say there's also um, issues sometimes with noise and smells, and I don't know if those are going to be addressed. But um, but I think in general, I think mixed use is wonderful, and I applaud that, and I think it's a good idea. Um, but it's not without you know it has to be thought through to make it work well for both the commercial tenants and the um, apartment dwellers. And I think it's great that there's going to be more rentals in Katani. So I think that ends my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Okay, I see a citizen with their hand up. I'll go ahead and unmute you if you would like to make your public comment, citizen. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, I have a question for the applicant and of city staff. The on-site parking uh, uh, looks completely inadequate um, at a glance for the tenants, any of their guests, uh, the owners of the businesses, the employees to the businesses, um, given the fact that public transportation is going to be going through a little bit of a re um, uh, relook, a revision now in the light of the events of the last uh, few weeks, um, how popular public transportation is going to be going forward. I'd like a little bit more information about uh, how they've calculated adequate parking, on-site parking, giving all those elements that are going to be using that property, and whether or not the adjacent lot where there's a house is um, has been considered to be acquired, brought into this project for additional parking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll check in with uh, Olivia Irvin. Do you have any comments? I don't. Thank you. And we will also check in with Nancy. Nancy, do you have any comments? Thinking. 
Um, so with respect to the fire department, we, they've been involved since day one with this project all the way back to when it first came in as a conceptual plan review. Um, mostly, uh, we spent a lot of time making sure that there was sufficient fire access through the, through the parking area, that their, their apparatus could, could move through it. And also we talked about safety at the roadway as well with the police department. So what of the right turn only is the exit, but for anytime you're exiting the property, you would have, from the parking lot, you would have to make a right turn. So the concern at East Katati, if you make a right turn out of there, you're going to be avoiding the fire station, which is located between La Plaza and Old Red. So you won't be traveling in front of that fire station. That was specifically to avoid, um, you know, left turns trying to maneuver through a merging lane or the center turn lane as well as two other lanes on the right-hand side. So there was too much going on there, um, and it did come up as a safety issue. So that's why we're restricting it to right turn only uh, on, uh, as you exit the property. Likewise, we're doing the same thing as you exit the property on the Charles Street in, in part to avoid the congestion, any additional congestion that might occur at Charles and Old Red. Um, I recognize that the crossing there um, can be difficult uh, and that some drivers are just in too big of a hurry and they aren't watching the crosswalks appropriately. Um, there is, in the long range uh, general plan, eventually that would be uh, a signalized intersection, which would improve the pedestrian crossing there. But currently, it's it's not that it, it's just not being done yet. It's not on the uh, not part of this project. The way we've approached, the way we're dealing with the the Charles Street Old Red intersection is to avoid it. By, by having the turns come out and go to the right, go down to Old Red instead of adding more cars to that, uh, to that intersection. But, the inter but this project itself won't do anything to, with respect to that intersection or its crossing. Um, regarding the bike lanes, there's no bike lane on Charles Street that's proposed. It would have, would have uh, sidewalks. Um, and I <laughs> So I'll have to look for the width on the sidewalk. The width of the sidewalk there is five feet. Five feet. Okay, thank you. It's five feet. There's no bike lane proposed on Charles Street. There's not enough space for a bike lane. Um, the bike lane along East Katati Avenue is to be five feet wide, and currently it's not proposed to be green, um, though. I would not have no problem recommending that to our, our city engineer because I think it's very effective when, when the green paint's down. But currently, it's not proposed to include that. And then, um, let's see, the parking, parking. So the answer is it has shared use parking as well. It relies on street parking and parking in the general vicinity. The whole downtown specific plan. Uh, puts an emphasis on shared parking throughout. So that's what this project does. It um, utilizes a shared parking approach as well as it uses uh, some of the street parking. There was more street parking at the beginning of this project and maybe less if the city engineer chooses to, to uh, uh, get rid of the parking along East Katati Avenue. I can tell you that um, it's consistent with what we've been doing in the downtown area with respect to parking. It, it, and I think that's all I can add that I can say to that. Uh, generally, a multi-use would require uh, in a, the apartments would require 24 spaces. Um, we're putting 40 spaces on, on site there. And I think that they've done and maximize as much parking as we could do while still having buildings that provide uh, sufficient living space and commercial space. It's just a challenging site to work with. <laughs> um, let me see if there was, oh, regarding the oak tree, there, there's a large bay tree and then there's some smaller oak trees. None of the existing trees on the parcel will remain, unfortunately. 
the way the project takes advantage of the entire property and removes all existing trees and then just replants trees for the parking lot and the street trees. There will have to be a tree removal permit, and actually the city council will have to choose whether or not to allow those trees to be removed. I think that's, I think I've covered everything. Great. And I don't know if Henry, you want to add anything to that? JP, there was one last one where the, was the house considered? Oh, yes, the house. So that's where the frame shop is. Between this proposal and the frame shop, there's also another narrow parcel that comes from the old map. And we really, really encourage the applicants to acquire that vacant land to make a better project, to add more parking, to increase, just make a better project. And they were strongly interested in acquiring, but they couldn't, basically they couldn't come to terms with the person that owns the property next door. So obviously if you can't get the vacant land, you don't go for the one where the frame shop is as well. So no, it doesn't include the frame shop, and it doesn't include the very thin parcel between these parcels and the frame shop. Okay. Henry, did you have anything else to say? I think, I think JP covered it for the most part, but, but that, that parcel to the south is one parcel. It's, it's got the frame shop on it, and it has some, it was, it was, obviously it was a, before it was a commercial use, it was a residential use, and it's got a backyard to it. And we did try to acquire that. The, the, you know, sometimes you think you've got a golden parcel, and they just didn't, weren't reasonable in their, in their sales price on it. So we, we, we looked at it, we made a good run at it, but it just, it didn't pencil to, to, to do that. But that said, we, our design is such that somebody, either that owner or a future owner could mimic the style and develop a building that would be consistent with the building we started and, and build it, you know, three, four inches away from our building and continue that look of the frontage of the building and have a couple of residential units above it. And I'm sure we could work out a access easement agreement to circulate through our parking lot and as well as going to the existing commercial parking lot that is, is fairly large to the south that, that supports the buildings that are on Old Redwood Highway. And again, the, the, we, we had more parking on East Katahdi at one time, but the relocation of the bus stop and the acceleration and deceleration lanes wiped out about five spots on East Katahdi. And those parking spots fit in an eight foot wide parallel parking spot, then the five foot bike lane, and then the 11 foot traffic aisle and the 12 foot median in the, in the center, center turn lane. And like, also like JP said that in the, in the general plan, Charles Street and East Katahdi is, is planned to be signalized in the future. Okay, so I'm going to bring this back to the commission for any kind of questions of staff or the applicant. So I'm going to start with Steve. I'm here and I have no further questions. Okay, Brittany. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I'm really pleased to see the opportunities moving forward, hopefully to kind of bring together more area of our downtown and, and just create more space for all of us to commune in one area. It's, it's really exciting to me to see that. So I'm very supportive of what I saw here in the presentation today in Red Group, but I did have some questions or comments on 
um, kind of the look and feel of the building. And um, while I think that the mixed use is wonderful and um, the discussion we had today about parking, um, the layout, um, traffic, it sounds like it was all very well thought out. Um, I did have some, hopefully would kind of be minor uh, questions about whether or not we could rethink or um, kind of think of other ways to um, change the look a bit to have more of a flow into our downtown. So uh, my only concern there is I know with our downtown we are working with a fairly old downtown with um, historic buildings and when I look at the renderings, which I realize are just renderings, so it's hard to get a, a, a full picture of it, it looks, um, it looks to me like it may just have some difficulty flowing. And I'm not sure if there are recommendations that the applicant um, or staff, or maybe with the applicant and staff working together moving forward um, to, to provide ways to um, kind of help make that a little bit more seamless, whether it be um, you know, looking at the, the tile siding um, and maybe doing something a little bit more, um, something different there, something more brick, or, or maybe it's something like adding more greenery to the building, like vines, just kind of softening up the look of it. Um, perhaps it's looking at like the roof tiles um, and, and looking for more of kind of that Spanish mission feel. Um, but to me, that's, that was my one concern is I felt like I was having a hard time grasping how it would flow from our downtown look and feel. And so I wanted to put that out there and ask if we were to move this forward, if I was to approve this, if we could possibly consider having um, a, another look into that, and possibly with the applicant and the staff working together, not necessarily to come back to us, but um, just more of a conversation on um, and guidance on how to move forward with that. And I also want to mention that um, the bike lane, as far as providing a green bike lane, I would be in support of that as well. Great. All right, I'm going to move on to Sylvia. Yes, I'm in agreement with a lot of what I've heard today, and uh, I don't have any further questions. Okay, so I have a couple questions. Um, so, I actually more comments than questions. I agree with having the green striping for the um, bike path. I think that's a kind of a no-brainer. Um, I do agree with Brittany with a lot of her comments that I think the building is pretty unremarkable looking. Um, I know, you know, Gitani's a little funky on our buildings and we all have kind of a, a different kind of look. Um, I don't think any building's really the same as the next. And so just to have this softened up or to have it just not be so, and I hate to say this, but cookie cutter, as in like Windsor, um, it, it just looks to me that, that, that that's what that kind of looks like. So um, those are my comments just about the, this maybe softening with some greenery or just doing a little bit more non-monochromatic um, colors. Um, that's my, my comment on that. Um, on the flashing lights for that one pedestrian crossing, I think we should actually look into that. Um, I think the other pedestrian crossing on East Katati Avenue is very successful. It has the flashing lights and then you can, many people I see use those very successfully. I don't think we've had any kind of fatalities at that. Um, and then there's one other thing. Uh, oh, I just want to say I'm very pleased that the applicant has taken to putting and recycling and composting into this. Um, and that's one of my passions. And so, um, yeah, I was, it was nice to not have to comment on that, to put it in, that it was already put in. So, um, I think those are our comments. Do we have any other, JP, did you want to say anything? Um, I would ask um, if you do have some ideas about design, I think Brittany mentioned a couple, um, that you 
suggest them so that the applicant and I can work together to address them more concretely. I'm hearing greenery, and that you can agree or disagree with some of these, it would be helpful. Greenery to help soften the building. I heard tile roof, which to help capture the mission as opposed to the metal roof. The brown wainscoting, I think it's difficult to see, but I'm not sure what the texture on that is, if that would have a brick or stone texture look to that, but we could move to something more natural looking, as opposed to more downtown, as opposed to like a tile that has a real urban feel to it, is I guess what I'm thinking. But it would be helpful, I think, for both me and the applicant if you had specific things you would like to see addressed. I think the building mass, the building shape, kind of like just the way it is, is really good for the site, and I don't think that there's much that we can do that. So we're really talking about the finishing details. Am I correct? Am I hearing that correctly from the commission? Well, I'll speak on that. I think you're definitely hearing it correct from me. When we looked at the hotel, I felt the design on that was much more in tune with the feel that we have in Katahdi, and a lot of the textures and materials that they used on the outside of that, I wouldn't say it would have to be exactly the same, but I felt it was more, you know, like you said, more the style of what we see in Katahdi for commercial buildings. With, like you said, not so, I don't even have the words for this, but just maybe just a little bit more texture with the building. Does that make sense? I think so. Let me ask Henry if he thinks he's got some direction. Yeah, just, yeah, I, our intent is not to do anything. I don't like to use the word Disneyland, but some of Windsor just is a little too cookie cutter, and I hear what one of the commissioners said, and I, you know, unfortunately with, we can do some pretty good 3D graphics, but that's not our intent here, and maybe the tile that we've selected is a little too urban, and we could switch that material to either a brick form, especially if we went to the tile roof. We had tile roof on this at one time early on, and we didn't want to hearken too much to trying to be historic. We wanted to try to have a fresh, forward-thinking design and pick up on the elements of the DSP, but put it in a contemporary vein. But I think I hear you about the texturing of that, and the tile might be too smooth, and we either pick a stone material or a brick material, and we'd be glad to work with JP on coming up with that right formula. We can also add some, you know, I don't want to say planter boxes on that lower level, but the idea was, and maybe in our renderings we could have put in more potted plants and things that would have, not rely on somebody to water them, but also have irrigation systems to them, but be done in a free form to intermix with some outdoor dining areas. If, you know, one of those corner spots happens to become a restaurant, we would encourage some outdoor dining. If it's a coffee shop or a patisserie or something that would have outdoor seating, we would want to try to integrate some of that greenery with it, and it's going to take some of that, you know, outdoor bistro feel 
people to come and, and uh, uh, mingle and, and uh, want to stay in the space. And, that, and, and our tenants, I'm sure we're going to want to make sure that, that that happens for them. So bottom line, we, we can certainly work with, uh, with, with staff on coming up with some solutions to help, uh, as you say, soften the pedestrian level of the project. Okay. Thank you. Brittany, does that satisfy some of your concerns? Um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I, in regard to JP's comment, I would just add, like you said, um, yes, I think if we could re reconsider or discuss um, at the lower level what that material looks like. I, I know that there have been many discussions on this in the past, but um, personally looking at it now, I think there should be a nice kind of consistency or flow um, to match the historic look of our downtown. So I'm sure there are um, ways, you know, as, as someone who's been in the field for so many years to provide that to us, even though we can't put it into words. So I'm confident that you guys can figure that out. But to me, what again, what stands out is that lower level material, um, the material on the roof, it being metal, I, I do think that something um, different on the roof, maybe more the mission style would be a, a better uh, transition into our downtown look. And then also um, uh, maybe looking at um, the kind of the roof line. Um, and again, I apologize that I don't necessarily know all the terminology, but that roof line. And, um, and I think what I just wanted to emphasize again is that uh, I'm e eager to see this move forward. Um, I don't want to put up roadblocks because I do think it's so valuable for our community to have more opportunity to commune in space like this. So um, I would feel comfortable moving forward knowing that our staff is um, having close communication and the ability to provide um, you know, guidance on how to change this look and feel or tweak it, I should say. I don't want to say change it because the build is very nice, um, but tweak it in a way that kind of helps that transition into our downtown. Does that help, JP? Yeah, I think that's helpful. And then Henry and I will have some conversations about it. I think um, I think I've gotten some decent direction. And yeah, we can move forward. Okay. Lauren? Um, I'm sorry. Joe Mark, can you, will you uh, ask the other members if they want us to come back to the Planning Commission for final design review? Or the way I have it structured now is that it comes back to design review administration, which is largely staff. Um, and so I just would like to know if you did want to take another look at it. Okay. Steve, do you want to take another look at it? Well, I do, and I think it is. Okay. Brittany? Uh, no, I'm comfortable with um, the staff looking at it. Okay. Sylvia? I'm, I'm also comfortable with staff looking at it. Okay. So that's the direction we have. I was going to, Lauren asked me if I wanted to open a public hearing again. Yes. Would you like to do that, Chair Moore? How many people do we have? Uh, I see one hand raised for public comment at this time. Uh, okay, we can open back up. Okay. Uh, citizen, I see your hand raised if you'd like to go ahead and speak for public comment. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. I'll be very brief. I didn't think my, my question was uh, 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 sufficiently addressed regarding the possibility of the applicant purchasing the property on Charles Street and the home and the lot and expanding the parking uh, on Charles Street. And then I had a brief comment about um, any member of the Planning Commission who um, does live within 500 feet of this project, to, that they can not only not ask questions, but they should be recusing themselves from this entire issue. So um, I appreciate if the commission keep that in mind that um, uh, that uh, not allowing a commissioner to make a question is not enough. They must recuse themselves from this this item completely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anyone else? At this time, I see no more hands raised. Okay, uh, I'm going to close. Please. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Chair Moore. Uh, Ms. Alderman has raised her hand. Okay. Go ahead, please. I, I just also wanted to reiterate that Neil needs to be 
recused from this part of the meeting somehow. It's not, he, if it was a live meeting in person, he wouldn't be allowed in the room. So I disagree with George on that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else, Lauren? I see no other hands up. All right, I'm gonna close public hearing. And JP, I think you have our direction that we, um, on some of the items, so I just wanted to reiterate. Um, so one of the things that wasn't addressed was the house on Charles Street. Can we just address that? Yeah, I think um, I'm not aware of any attempt to purchase that property. It never came up in our discussions. Uh, we, we were focused on the property on La Plaza uh, to acquire that one to bring it into the project. Um, but we not the property on Charles. Okay. I don't know if any, I don't know if there was something happened in the background that I'm unaware of. Though. All right, great, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna bring this back to the commission. I think you have all of our comments that need to be addressed. Um, so I'm looking to get a motion. We're gonna have two motions on this. And recall that there's a, there's a slight change in the title to the resolution. Um, resolution that begins on page 128 for building number two. Uh, the title should read 7,162 square feet, not 6,992 square feet of commercial space. Okay. Okay. Is it possible to pull, this is um, Brittany McKinney, is it possible to pull the motion up onto the screen? I'm trying to scroll through now, but it is taking some time. So I got one on 105 and one on 128. They so say you do those better than anyone. Do you want me just to do it? I, uh, uh, Chair Moore, I'd be happy to do the second motion on one thing. Okay, so. Um, there, are, there are also shown at, um, on the, uh, I was gonna say on the, on the agenda. So just be the resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Catania approving preliminary design review for a new two-story mixed-use building consisting of six residential units. And, uh, and this is the one that's changed, right, JP? No, the second one is. Second one. So 6,992 square feet of commercial space located at 128 East Catania Avenue. Oops. So I, I, got one to one. I got it though. I think we got it. A second. All right. So I'm just going to do a roll call. Um, Steve? Yes. Brittany? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. This sounds right. And I, yes. So, and then Brittany, you're going to do the second one? Yes. So, um, Oh, before you start, I'm sorry, this is Lauren Burgess. Uh, mm -hmm. Chair Moore, if I could just interject, I'm also going to show Commissioner Hancock as recused. Yes, thank you so much. And Neil did recuse himself fairly quickly. And if you would like also, I would uh, go ahead and complete the roll call vote for you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So I, I would like to move um, the next resolution, which I believe is on page 128. It similarly states um, a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Katati approving preliminary design review for a new two-story mixed-use building consisting of six residential units and 7,162 square feet of commercial space located at 128 East Katati Avenue. Hey, Lauren. The roll call? I need a second, I'm sorry. Give me a second. 
Can you ready one a second? I'll second it. Okay. Stephen. Now, now roll call. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Lemus. Yes. Commissioner Oneith. Yes. Vice Chair McKinley. Yes. Chair Moore. Yes. And Commissioner Hancock is recused. Thank you very much. Thank you all. That was well done, Lori. Yes, thank you, um, Chair and other commissioners. Appreciate your uh, help and support on the project. Great. Good luck. Thank you. We're going to need it. <laughs> so we're going to move on to... Um, So item two, which is the Economic Development Strategy Implementation Program Zoning Code Amendments, Rezoning and Associated Negative Le Declaration. Thank you, Chair Moore. This is uh, Planning Director or Community Development Director Noah Hausch. Uh, this item begins on packet page 151. Uh, and just while the city clerk gets the PowerPoint going. I just really want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, that goes out to obviously all the planning commissioners and members of the public who are participating, uh, but also staff and the consultants uh, who are on the line and, and help to get this meeting together. Um, this is a culmination of a significant amount of effort, both short term on the part of the city manager and city clerk staff to put all this together and, and make uh, this meeting possible under the, the new situation and, and regulations that we're, we're living under. Uh, but also longer term, um, given that the consultants and the city manager and, and frankly city council as well have, have uh, prioritized this project and have been working on it since June. Um, and just before we get into it, uh, again, I just want to say thank you, but um, I just want to highlight uh, that this entire effort is intended to support uh, our existing and future businesses. Uh, with the goal to kind of clarify some of our processes and give flexibility in how uh, these businesses can operate. And given the uncertainty facing uh, the community and, and the business folks out there, staff finds that the timing of this item is even more critical uh, than it was, you know, just a few weeks ago. And so the process to this evening is um, it's going to be a collaborative presentation from myself uh, as the director of the department and um, staff from Loki and Planning and Associates. We have both Dick and Mike Loki on the lines. Uh, they're going to do a majority of the presentation, but after their initial introduction of the item, I'm going to uh, present a summary of the, the direction received from the Planning Commission during the February workshop on this item, uh, as well as the response from staff. And then after this, uh, I'll hand it back to Dick to present a majority of the materials. And then we're going to all participate in uh, kind of responding to uh, comments or, commi or commissioner direction that comes up through that conversation. And so with that, I will hand it over to Dick, and I believe he is probably going to ask to drive the presentation from Laura. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dick Loki. Um, thank you very much for setting this up, and it's a, a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, as those of you who participated in the February workshop know, um, we spent a, a great deal of time collaboratively with uh, the staff, uh, the city manager's office, um, and notably a, a number of property owners throughout, throughout the study area, um, beginning with an analysis of our land resources, what's available, some of the constraints that has limited economic development in and around the downtown, <clears throat> as well as the opportunities we see on the horizon. And our planning process obviously looks to the midterm and long term uh, in an effort to accomplish the goals you see on the slide here. <clears throat> we heard from um, uh, not only our economist who's been part of the team uh, but in talking with property owners that we needed to have a structured program that would be able to attract um, new development and enhance the businesses that are already here in and around the downtown with the goal of capturing a larger share of discretionary purchases, uh, bringing additional services and jobs, 
in a traditional mixed use context to the downtown. Um, we also uh, learned that it was important to, uh, where we could, introduce flexibility as well as incentives to bring projects forward, such as the one you just saw, a perfect example of mixed use in the downtown um, that relies on uh, the ability to uh, have flexible parking standards uh, to draw from the uses around it. Um, it was also important um, in looking at the, the code, looking at the, the uh, zoning map and process to um, identify uses in particular that would be complementary of one another, uh, uses that not only would enhance, enhance quality of life in Katati, uh, but uses that would be sustainable over time. Um, uh, that have experiential quality to them, not just conventional retail that uh, these days is undermined largely, or at least to a certain extent, by online shopping. Very challenging set of tasks. And so what we have uh, brought before you this evening is a program that looks at zoning code changes. These are relatively minor changes that focus on these four co core goals. Um, one zoning map change that has to do with um, pre-zoning a property consistent with the general plan and streamlining uh, the permit process. Katati has a very good permit process currently, uh, but we spent a lot of time kind of sweating the details based on what we heard from applicants and property owners the experience of the staff in ways that could bring projects forward more promptly, uh, get better feedback and more accurate feedback early um, before a great deal of money was spent in the wrong direction in particular. Um, and then finally, we put together some supporting information that will, we believe, help applicants, help the community uh, to be better formed as projects are processed. So um, coming off the workshop uh, in February, uh, uh, a number of refinements were made uh, to the toolboxes that uh, had been introduced and one additional toolbox was drafted. And uh, Noah, if you would like to review those, um, I'll turn it back to you. Otherwise, um, Michael and I can walk through those. Yeah, I'll just uh, briefly present on the next few slides, but you can keep uh, control of the presentation. Uh, so as Dick identified, uh, on February 18th, the Planning Commission held a workshop to uh, allow the public and the commissioners to consider the proposed economic development program. And uh, it did also include a mitigated negative declaration, uh, analyzing the potential environmental impacts of the project. Uh, the zoning code changes that Dick identified um, referencing uh, land use tables, and those are primarily in, uh, the land use changes are primarily in toolbox B, but there are some changes uh, to other sections of the code primarily to clarify things. And uh, also the future potential options for additional economic development strategy efforts that could be considered by the community um, after reviewing this and, and acting on this item. So as a part of that public hearing or public meeting workshop, the commissioner comments were generally supportive, but there were some concerns identified, and those are primarily uh, summarized on this slide. Uh, and initially, there was some concern over the loss of public process, including public participation and the commissioner's decision authority. Um, a review of the land use tables in, in Toolbox B identifies that there are some uses which are proposed to be reduced from a use permit to a minor use permit, uh, or a minor use permit going to a by right use. Um, and again, the concern was primarily to preserve opportunities for public and commissioner input. There were uh, some concerns over the limited scope of the economic development strategy. Uh, you'll recall it targeted primarily uh, properties in the downtown specific plan, but not all downtown parcels. Um, there was limited uh, changes to parcels on East Katati that were commercially zoned, but um, uh, were 
included in the overall initial strategy area. Uh, and so the consultants directed staff, or I'm sorry, the commission directed staff to broaden these efforts to the entire city um, with making the effort more equitable and obviously to support downtown development. Uh, and specifically, some uh, direction was provided to revisit the definition of artisan craft production uses and where that's allowed. Um, the commissioners identified some uses as generally inconsistent with the Katahdi community character uh, and had some concerns over those, and, and that was specific to sp uh, certain land uses in Toolbox B, primarily automotive oriented. And then um, there were some concerns over the potential future implementation of Toolbox H uh, and how these recommended changes uh, or approaches may fit within the existing regulatory framework. And so briefly, staff just wanted to respond to some of those, and the next slide uh, is kind of a summary of that, and of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions um, that come up after the presentation. So just briefly on the, the loss of partic public participation and commission decision authority, uh, the, the proposed project does uh, change some of the specific land uses in the zoning tables from use permits to minor use permits, as imagined, or as previously mentioned. Uh, minor use permits are decided by the director, but at a public hearing, fully noticed, and are appealable to the Planning Commission. And then some uses are proposed to go from minor use permits to buy right land uses. But staff uh, wanted to highlight that um, new development, any new development, uh, would still require a fully noticed public hearing before the Planning Commission to grant design review, approve the CEQA documentation uh, associated with that, uh, recommend, make a recommendation to the city council on any subdivision. And then uh, if there was a minor use permit that was proposed as a part of that, then those changes or that process would also be elevated to the planning commission because the city zoning code identifies that any um, element of a project that's required to be decided by a higher authority level um, must, all of those actions must be decided by that authority level. And staff just wanted to point out that the project that was just before the commission is actually an excellent example of this uh, because all the, the proposed land uses associated with that development were by rights. There was no discretionary element to uh, the proposed project except the secret determination and the design. And so that's just an example of how uh, some of those projects, even if for by right land uses for new development, would be brought still to the Planning Commission at a full public hearing and, and just wanted to step on to highlight that. And we see that the, the changes in the process from use permits to minor use permits or minor use permits to buy right um, would primarily, be, that would not go through kind of that larger process, would primarily be for existing uh, empty tenant spaces that were being retented with new businesses. And again, that's some of the intent of this is to streamline that process allow existing businesses to be more creative, hopefully expand their operations into maybe some vacant spaces that have opened up next door. And so we just wanted to really highlight that. Um, with regards to some of the concerns over community character, uh, the commission directed staff to revisit, uh, or I'm sorry, this to, to some of the concerns regarding downtown and, and the potential to expand some of these changes citywide. The commission directed staff to revisit these proposed changes uh, and specifically consider how downtown uh, development might be more incentivized. And so staff took another look at that and, and uh, any changes in the packet that are highlighted in green came about as, as a result of direction from the commission. So uh, as the commission has gone through their packets, as the public's reviewing them, they'll see some changes were made both to the land use tables, but also to the definitions of some of the uh, existing land uses in the code. And again, um, those changes were broadened out to all parcels in the downtown and parcels uh, that are zoned um, for the commercial East Katani corridor, so Oliver's and, and some of the businesses in that area. And then uh, with regards to some of the concerns that the commissioners voiced regarding certain uses, primarily many storage or automotive oriented businesses not necessarily being appropriate for the character of Katani, Staff either eliminated any proposed changes to those um, or maintained the current use permit requirements, and those are identified in toolbox B as well. And then finally, this last slide, uh, I just really wanted to speak to kind of some of the intent behind 
the CEQA and, and uh, environmental impact proposals uh, of Toolbox H. Toolbox H really identified that uh, uh, the city could consider funding a biologic assessment of parcels that are likely to, to develop or redevelop in the near term and that are also likely to have the or have the potential for biologic resources. Uh, almost all of the city, the downtown part of the city is, is governed by the uh, the conservation strategy of the uh, Santa Rosa Plain. And so there are a significant amount of biologic resources or potential biologic resources without, throughout the community. And so what this action essentially um, proposed that the city could fund or participate in in some way, a uh, biologic assessment of those parcels to quantify the exact extent of biologic resources, whether it's wetlands or um, upper habitat for uh, California tiger salamander. So that way, as development moved forward, um, folks in the community and the commission would have a good idea of where those resources are located, and then the development projects or the review authorities for those could consider how um, those resources should be impacted or preserved uh, as a result of uh, the proposed development. And I just highlighted here, um, the downtown specific plan identified in chapter two, um, the goal of a wetlands interpreter center in an area that is known to have wetlands uh, as an amenity rather than an area that may be uh, developed and then those wetlands mitigated offsite. So that's, the goal was to allow implementation of some of that existing policy by quantifying some of those existing resources. So staff just wanted to provide some clarity with that because that element seemed to be a little bit confusing, uh, and so we wanted to add to that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dick Loki. But again, I'm absolutely available for any questions towards the end, and um, really look forward to uh, this discussion tonight. Thank you, Noah. Um, I want to just uh, reiterate uh, one of the last things that Noah has said, that in our interviews with property owners and developers, um, one of the common themes was a lack of understanding of the complexities, the multiple layers of constraints associated with protection of biological resources. And so one of the most powerful tools we, of course, can do from the public side is inform people uh, to make sure they have consistent and complete information from which to make those critical first decisions so that they don't pursue um, the wrong approach or uh, end up spending a lot of money on something that ultimately won't work. Uh, so we think that uh, that program of, uh, of funding this research over time will be invaluable uh, and will result in a, a more sensitive and uh, um, hopefully accelerated process of, of uh, attracting economic development. What I'm going to do next is briefly walk through a series of maps and then um, outline the recommendations of the program as a whole. And uh, from there, we can get into the details of the individual toolboxes. What you're looking at here in terms of the strategy area, of course, includes all four of the uh, downtown specific plan districts on the east side of uh, Highway 101, as well as the Gravenstein Corridor uh, extending uh, in the direction of Sebastopol to the west. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see that we've got, um, uh, we've begun to uh, develop a little bit better understanding of properties that are vacant or largely underdeveloped, as opposed to those that are developed or partially developed. And this was important uh, primarily just to give us a sense of magnitude of land resources and where development is likely to occur. The zoning districts that are in place today are those that you see on this slide. Um, obviously, the orange representing the Gravenstein corridor commercial area is predominant. You'll see the four uh, downtown specific plan districts um, as well as the commercial industrial gray colored area uh, 
northward adjoining Highway 101. And in between the Gravenstein Corridor and that commercial industrial gray area is a cross-hatched property or group of properties that are unincorporated but within the city's sphere of influence and its planning area boundary that the general plan currently designates for, again, GC or Gravenstein Corridor commercial. The proposal is to pre-zone that property consistent with the general plan. And in a future step, the city can, if the property owner is interested, work with them in consideration of annexation. But an annexation is not part of the current program. With that said, as an overview, as Noah mentioned earlier, we did prepare an initial study and draft negative declaration. That document was updated to reflect some of the comments that were submitted during the review period. One public letter in particular that required answers to questions and also to cover some of the changes that Noah has just outlined in the various toolboxes that were updated. The conclusions of the initial study remain that these changes in the zoning code and the permitting process do not have any potential for environmental effects of their own. All of the projects that would come in the future are subject to CEQA and would go through environmental review according to your normal procedure. Consequently, we've recommended adoption of the negative declaration. The code amendments include, again, both text changes, the addition of definitions, changes in land use classifications within the various districts in the study area. And those are embodied in a series of toolboxes that we'll get to in a moment. We broke them down into different categories so that they would be more readily identified as changes and understood. And again, the only zoning map change is to put a pre-zoning designation on those 15 acres to the Gravenstein Corridor Commercial District. And that's simply an indication of what the future zoning would be at the time the property is eventually annexed. Item four on the slide has to do with future implementation items. Those are not items that are included in the commission's consideration this evening, but we felt it was important as part of this overall program to look forward to other things that could be done to further enhance this economic development effort. And so those future action items are there for your consideration and thinking as we go forward in the months to come. Schedule-wise, you can see that we're towards the end of this initial program. We're a little bit behind. When the commission is done with its review, this entire package goes to the council for an independent de novo hearing. And then lastly, I'm going to close with an overview of these toolboxes, what's been changed and what's new since your workshop in February. The unchanged toolboxes are A, C, E, and G. And these have to do with the application preparation and processing, the design review process, alcoholic beverage sales, a very minor adjustment to the language in the code to make it consistent with your procedures, and the informational toolbox having to do with grant opportunities. The other toolboxes have been modified to reflect the changes that Noah was talking about. In particular, toolbox B as in boy, that has to do with 
the land uses within each of the zoning districts. Toolbox D, having to do with mixed use projects where we amended one of the figures to better reflect the language in the code. Toolbox F, where definitions were added as Noah outlined a moment ago for in particular the four downtown districts. And lastly, Toolbox H, where the language was rewritten to be more consistent with the intention of being purely an informational document that would provide additional resources. With that, I'm going to stop our presentation and we can get into the details of the changes, including those items that have been marked green, particularly in Toolbox B as the commission has questions, if that's acceptable. Unmute myself. Is that acceptable to the rest of the commission? Yes. Steve? Yes. Okay. Yes. We can start on Toolbox B. Would you like us to do a little introduction of each of these toolboxes as we walk through them? That would be fine. We have a new planning commissioner that was not at the February meeting. So I think a little information regarding some of the changes and why would be great for her. Okay. I'm going to start and Noah and Michael may want to jump in on some of the more important topics here. In Toolbox B, you will see color coding with yellow, red, and green. The yellow changes were our original recommendations to encourage things like artisan craft manufacturing, for example, in the CG district by making a change from major use permit to minor use permit. And in the commercial industrial district from minor use permit to permitted. You'll see that the red changes were ones that involved districts outside the original boundaries of the strategy area. But as, again, Noah outlined, we pulled those in for the ability to kind of expand this program outward. And then green are the changes that were responsive to comments and suggestions made by the planning commission during the workshop. As we, the PowerPoint doesn't have the details, but as you get into the packet, beginning on page 156, table, excuse me, I should say Toolbox B goes through initially the Gravenstein Corridor and other zoning districts, both within the downtown specific plan area and in the rest of the strategy area, and looks at optional changes in the CE, CD, and PF districts. Those, again, are all recommended because we tried to take a kind of unifying, consistent approach, and we didn't want to leave those nearby properties and opportunities out. And so in the table, table 2-3, one of the things that jumps out right away are the changes that were introduced following the February workshop to accommodate brewery and brew pubs by minor use permit in those commercial districts. And you'll notice that, and this is kind of a subtlety and theme that runs throughout the entire program, we tried to target those uses that are, I won't say recession proof because nothing is, but they're less brick and mortar 
material goods retailing uses and more experiential uses. Yes, there are products for sale, but they're combined with some kind of a social activity that makes them kind of synergistic with one another, with activity and social gathering, and uses that can't readily be duplicated outside of a downtown setting. They're very appropriate for a downtown. In addition to the brew pub uses, we picked up studio uses and added them in the CE district at the commission's suggestion, and we added tasting rooms, again, with standards to control the uses. We added lodging, boutique hotel or motel uses by use permit in the CE, CG, and CD districts, and we added some, in notes, some development standards for operation of uses like artisan craft production uses. I'm going to, at this point, pause and ask if members of the commission have specific questions about these changes and the overall program outlined in Toolbox B. All right. So on this particular item, I think I'm going to start first. This is Lisa. I think most of the changes I find fine. One of them on page 169, you still have drive-through retail allowed in the city of Katani. Am I? Commissioner Moore, that's a land use that we, previously we were proposing to make changes, and the direction was, you know, we heard loud and clear not to make changes, so that's the current code as it is. So that's, the current code is allowing it in CG and C1? Correct, with the use permit approval from the planning commission. Well, I would propose that actually that just be not allowed, the use not allowed. So that would be my recommendation on that, if we're making changes. And then on the permitted outdoor dining, that's now a permitted use. So one of my questions was that, is that a, I'm trying to look through my notes here. Was that still a conditional use permit? I can't find my note here, but is that still a conditional use permit for down, for the specific plan area downtown? You're asking if, sorry, start way back on the drive-through. The drive-through uses are only permitted for pharmacies and ATMs in those districts, and that's clarified in zoning code section 17.42.070. So, yeah, so there are some notes that further clarify or provide very prescribed standards for how these uses are to operate, and that's one of them. So that's perfect. Thank you. Your question was, is outdoor dining in the specific plan area require a use permit? Yes. So the proposal is to, and this is a theme throughout the proposed changes, is that when there are kind of numerous layers of regulation affecting a land use, and I'll use the outdoor dining example. So right now, outdoor dining on public property would be required to meet certain prescribed standards regarding ADA access. If they were serving alcohol, they would have to meet all of the ABC requirements for separation of that alcohol. And so we are proposing that to be a by right land use, but subject to all those existing regulations that are in place separate from a use permit. Okay. Because I was just curious, like, I just had an example of this. It would be like the old Dos Amigos. 
that their outdoor dining in the back butts up against residential. And that's a permitted use now. That, that, would, that is a correct, uh, that would be a permitted use subject to, as I mentioned, ABC regulations and ADA regulations and also the city's noise ordinance. So um, up until I believe 11 p.m., they would be allowed to have activities that would generate a certain level of noise. And then obviously that, that allowed level of noise reduces significantly per the noise ordinance after certain triggers. That would be my concern about something like this. Would normally, um, especially for downtown, it would. We've had problems in the past where um, a conditional use permit has definitely um, softened those issues and allowed that use um, with some little more strict guidelines. And so. Um, just as a commissioner, I think my preference would be still having a conditional use permit to mitigate just for the downtown specific plan for that area where it really butts up against residential. So those are my comments. Um, I'll open this up for the rest of the commissioners. Um, Brittany? Um, I don't have any questions. I think after reviewing everything, it looked like everything I had noted from the previous workshop was included in here. So um, thank you for incorporating that. I appreciate it. Okay, Sylvia? Hi, yeah, I did have a question. On um, page 167, um, the brewery production in section in district CI and IG, it says it, it requires a use permit, but then um, on page 168, uh, winery production uh, is a minor use permit. So that was kind of like when one, one needs to come to the commission and one doesn't. So the consumer both production, it kind of seemed, I didn't know what the, whether there was a reason for that. Yeah, so that's a great, uh, a, a good catch. So um, in the industrial districts, which are CI and, and uh, IG, we are saying that uh, a beverage producer, whether it's a brewery or a winery, are essentially desirable, uh, or that's that's a good location for them, um, subject to certain regulations and limitations that would be reviewed through those processes. Uh, breweries can be a little bit more intensive than wineries, given that they, uh, you know, a winery is kind of a one time a year big push to get the crush in and the harvest uh, in and crush and process and then it's almost babysitting for a while so there's lower activity levels whereas breweries are more you know you have to brew beer every week or two to, in order to keep your supply going and so that's why the production brewery requires the use permit whereas the production or i'm sorry the boutique winery in those locations uh requires a minor use permit uh as well as a, the uh production winery but the idea was of allowing a boutique winery in the CG was that it could also be kind of an interesting land use to have a winery operation that folks could come visit, come see the wine produced, um, maybe be an accessory element to a tasting room or, or maybe have an accessory tasting room in the downtown might be something that was interesting, but definitely a use permit was needed to review the potential impacts associated with that, you know, because it is an agricultural product process. Whereas um, brew pubs are uh, limited in their volume of production, um, and as are boutique wineries, where that uh, the impacts would be able to be managed and analyzed through a minor use permit process, just given that by definition, some of those uses are, are constrained in how they would operate or what volumes they would be able to produce. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it sounds like um, it's more kind of like the, like you said, like a winery might be a one-time production versus a brewery produces a lot more often. So that's why um, uh, you're suggesting the minor use versus a regular uh, use permit. That's correct. And also, it's those in those areas, it's, it's an industrial use already, generally. <laughs> but we thought that a, a boutique winery might be somewhat interesting if it was done appropriately and managed. 
Okay, well, yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Steve, do you have anything? I'm wondering in a nod to Lori's earlier this evening uh, about the drive through retail in light of the events of the past few weeks, maybe we want to just let that slide uh, to see if there's any adjustment that could be done by some of the retail places uh, in conducting their business under these adverse conditions. That's my only comment. Uh, I will say that the uh, obviously you all are aware of the county health order and, and the state changes to the law, and so those businesses are allowed to operate that way under the current conditions, uh, regardless of what their use permit regulations may be. Um, but that's under the health orders from the state and the county. So you're opening up a whole new ball of wax here. There's some things beyond our purview that we're looking at now? Uh, no, it's more uh, our authority gets superseded in some elements. Um, and so while we have, we have, as an example, um, the Jaded Toad does not have any drive-through uses, um, but now you are allowed to go pick up food for delivery and they can run it out to your car, as one example. I understand. Thank you. But, yeah, obviously, after the health order is listed, that would that would go away. Right. I understand. Thank you. you no, know, I. This is Dick. I'd like to um, also point out that to the extent that we eliminate um, a use that is permitted by use permit under today's existing code, it has implications on nonconformity with respect to some existing businesses. Not many, but there could be a few, and that could be problematic. What would you intend to do about that? I think were the commission to amend the current code to eliminate what is today allowed by use permit, I think we would need to take a closer look at the implications on the ground. We've not done that. I agree with you. Uh, we, we don't want to add restrictions in the times that we're living in right now. Over to you, Chairman. Um, so, on that note, with um, Section B... So, um, I've got a comment as well. This is Neil Hancock. Oh, I'm sorry, Neil. That's right. You're back. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just looking at the discussion on the artisan types of use, I mean, I definitely liked that aspect of having something that would be social activities, but the only way that I see that being translated into the code is through the use of, uh, or through breweries, um, or wine, um, some sort of activity just to do with alcohol. And while that's definitely a, a part of my framework, I enjoy that, is that the only type of social activity that can be a business enhancer that has come up? No, and I appreciate that because uh, we do want to highlight that distinction. So these land use tables, so if you look at package page 174, artisan craft product manufacturing has been uh, modified to be allowed uh, in all of the um, downtown specific plan districts. With the minor use permit. Yeah. With the minor use permit. And that has, that's intentional because some of these uses, I mean, an artisan craft product manufacturing use is a manufacturing use. And so if we're going to be allowing them in um, areas of downtown, we do want to have some review authority to regulate how they do that product manufacturing uh, and minimize, you know, if they have large scale deliveries, if they use certain types of uh, potentially caustic materials that we want to be able to regulate and address and at least highlight for the fire department and surrounding uses that those are being utilized there. Um, but as you look to these land use changes, it's important to also look to um, the definitions themselves. And so those can be found 
Sorry, I'm going through my packet here. And I had pulled it apart, and so I am not jumping to it easily. Dick and Mike, if you can reference the page section where definitions start, I would appreciate it. It's page 184, Noah. Thank you, sir. So the definitions of those uses, and, and specifically artisan craft product manufacturing was modified uh, to broaden that definition out. Um, breweries were pulled out of there, and then all of these, these things were... Uh, I'm sorry. Isn't it you've done it under note five? There's an added note five. So, so added note five is still in the land use table. So what that says is if it's a new development that's proposing that type of use, the artisan craft product manufacturing land use must uh, be pedestrian oriented and have, and have pedestrian engaging elements to the design, regardless of what the use is, that it's a, a manufacturing use. So basically we didn't want just your standard um, kind of industrial development where it's, it's a, you know, it's a small office and then a, a roll up door with a, a shop associated with it. We wanted more of a pedestrian oriented retail design aesthetic and uh, engagement with the street and the surrounding uses. But we want to allow a broader uh, definition of uses there, which could occur production. And so if you look on page 184, artisan shop, is defined as, or I'm sorry, artisan craft product manufacturing is defined as establishments manufacturing or assembling small products primarily by hand, including jewelry, pottery, and other ceramics, as well as small glass and metal art and food craft products. So I was intentionally broadened out um, to allow a variety of potentially anticipated uses combined with the design requirements and the the uh, broader allowances for where that used to be located. So we kind of carved out brewery and winery from that definition, but then left that broader definition to include other foods such as cheese or maybe olives or something like that. And then also broad the allowances for where it can go while still keeping a little bit of uh, the city's ability to review those regulations. And that's through the use permit process. Good, thank you. And Neil, I, I just wanted to also highlight for you that we did include the definition of the separate specific plan uh, districts. Yes, I saw that. Thank you. Yes, because that, that's a request. And I apologize. I was not able to get a map together in time for the packet to be done. But I am working on that. And we will amend the zoning map to specifically break out those districts and highlight what they are and where they are for yeah. folks reviewing it. It still takes a lot to try and visualize, get all the integration in on the on the different um, the districts. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, at this point, I am going to take a little five minute break because we've been sitting here for two and a half hours. Okay, Commissioner Chair. All right, Chair Morton, I would ask that um, everybody just mute their mics for now while I uh, figure out how to pop. I, I know. I, I, I would say that we could keep going on, but um, but I can't. No, not a problem. Um, just please, everybody, mute your mics. Okay. So about five minutes, we'll be back up at uh, around 9.20, 5.26. Okay, thank you. thank you. All right. I just did.
Okay, Chair Moore, I think we're good to go. All right, I just want to make sure everybody's on. Hi, this is Sylvia. I'm back. You're back. Okay, Steve, you're on? Yes, I am. Okay, and then, um, Brittany, you're on? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. All right. Great. So all, all the commissioners are on. So I'm going to convene the meeting back to order, and we can start, if we don't have any more questions on Toolbox B, we can start on Toolbox C. Okay, this is Dick Loki again. Thank you all for your patience in going through what has turned out to be a, a, just a very substantial amount of detail, uh, a, a lot of... Uh, Refinement and careful thought obviously has gone into the unique character of each of these districts. And I should note that we deliberately broke these textual changes up into a series of toolboxes, um, not to make them bite-sized um, sections, but so that we could organize them by purpose. And as we get to toolbox C, we've not made any changes since the workshop and as you can see on the screen, the changes are relatively simple and straightforward. Um, the purpose is to streamline the design review process to stay focused um, on design um, as opposed to straying over into topics that involve land uses um, and circulation, for example. Um, there are other parts of the code that address that. So um, we have nothing further to add to this refinement other than to suggest that uh, uh, we think it will help speed the process along. Does anybody have any questions of Toolbox C? Even does not. All right. So hearing none, I think we can go move on to Toolbox so on Toolbox D, um, we originally drafted some language changes to add a little bit of flexibility, um, particularly in the CG and downtown districts, on how vertical and horizontal mixed-use projects... Yeah, come over do. here, do your thing over here. Lori, can you can you just mute your microphone just for a minute? Okay, go ahead. So between the study session and the packet that you have this evening, what you don't see is a simple little diagram change to make the uh, diagram that appears in the zoning code consistent with this language um, that, again, provides flexibility in these districts um, so as to create a predominantly uh, commercial frontage on the street and accommodate both horizontal and vertical mixed-use projects behind and above. Does anyone have any questions on Toolbox D? So I, I've got a question. Um, just in what you used, I uh, was trying to think this out. Um, when you say that there's a predominantly, um, you know, the street frontage, what about when we've got, um, and I'm just trying to think, make sure I understand this, it's probably uh, zoning districts and SP districts. What have we got like the, um, the, the different other, the church that's in the La Plaza area? Um, that wouldn't have to ever change to have a lot of um, frontage, would it? That's a different district. That's the HC district. Uh, yeah, and I would just add existing uses uh, are not required to do anything uh, under these 
regulations. It's just if they come forward to change, then they would be required to meet the new rules. And in that example, the church use could stay on the ground floor, but other uses, if it was to go to a mixed-use type development, the secondary floors would likely become residential. And so the commission will recall the primary change here is to change from a ratio of 75% commercial and 25% residential to allowing more flexibility. And some commissioners might recall that I used the example of, have you ever seen a mixed-use building that was three stories of commercial and one story of residential? It's just, there was odd requirements in this section that seemed almost like a typo, almost, frankly. But then there were some other elements where there were just very prescribed design characteristics. And we found that it was really difficult to implement that, or it may paint future development into an odd corner. And so we wanted to give the design professionals the flexibility while also meeting the intent of the specific plan and the goals of the city with regards to how mixed-use development would ultimately present to the street and develop. Right, yeah, I remember that discussion. But just thinking of this one example, because it's come up, and there is a benefit for, I think, for mixed usages in the sense that there's a lot of people that come to Neur Shalom. If they wanted to do a major renovation, would they need to then put on a lot of street frontage to do that? So usually, so if they were going to just essentially remodel their existing building, interior primarily, then that would be a building permit. They wouldn't even come through the planning department. It would just go straight to building permits. If they were proposing significant additions, the goal would be to have them do those additions in keeping with the prescriptions and the direction of these standards. And then with that example, it's important to know that that building is historic. And so it has a whole other kind of lens that any proposal would be looked at through. Okay, thank you very much. All right, does anyone else have anything on Toolbox D? Nothing. All right, seeing none, can we move on to Toolbox E? The recommended change in Toolbox E in the zoning code addresses alcoholic beverage sales. And the change here simply comes down to a permit posting requirement and conditions of approval being applied where a use permit is required. Otherwise, the ABC regulations prevail on their own. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on Toolbox E? Not me. No. No? Okay. We are going to move on to Toolbox F. Toolbox F contains definitions and specialized terms where we've added a definition for retail display gallery, for example. We've modified the definition of accessory retail or services. And we've also modified the definition of tasting room. These changes are relatively minor. But as you heard earlier this evening, we've also added some additional definitions pertaining to brewery, brew pubs, and boutique hotels that came off of the last workshop with the commission in February. We also slightly modified the definition for arts and craft product manufacturing, arts and shops, as mentioned. Some of the manufacturing definitions were just basically modified to reflect some of the other changes, pulling out breweries and wineries, et cetera. And then we did modify bed and breakfast because there was a concern that the current definition may actually allow short-term rental. And so we moved forward with clarifying that. 
uh, by adding a little bit of language requiring on-site managers or owners to live, uh, be, reside on-site. Thank you. So these changes show up in the packet beginning on uh, page uh, 184. Does anybody have any questions about these definitions? Not me. Okay, so if we're good with that, then we'll move on to um, Toolbox G. Uh, G is one of those items that doesn't require the Commission's action, but your comments are certainly welcome. It is an informational uh, toolbox um, that identifies at least at this point in time, a whole range of different funding opportunities for grants that could be harnessed to help um, leverage things like uh, capital facility improvements, uh, roadway improvements, uh, even perhaps help fund some of those technical studies that need to be completed. Uh, this is intended as a resource for uh, staff, for the public, uh, and for applicants uh, to help underwrite some of those very high costs of development that we want to uh, get a handle on to encourage economic development. Great. Does anybody have any comments about Toolbox G? No. 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 Okay. Um, informational Toolbox H. So at the beginning of this uh, evening's discussion on the economic development program, uh, Noah uh, summarized the changes to Toolbox H. Um, I simply want to emphasize that this is an informational document um, and that the requirements to the Santa Rosa Plain uh, Management Plan are in place. The city um, obviously uh, respects and, and follows that. And what we're trying to do is help uh, the public, help applicants, and help the staff um, identify where those critical constraints are. Um, much of the work that is identified here is technical in nature, it's scientific in nature, and uh, um, with some additional funding, uh, we hope that it would be possible to complete some of these uh, missing delineations and biological assessments to paint a more complete picture, picture. So as projects that come along that, for example, involve more than one property um, or might involve an entire property where there's an important constraint, we have that information available in advance as a resource. Again, based on the interviews we conducted, one of the most painful experiences was for the applicant who was uninformed about some of these constraints uh, to uh, spend a great deal of money and time uh, without being informed and without a project that was designed to be sensitive to them. So a lot of work is to be done here, uh, but this is informational for purposes of this evening's meeting. Yeah, and I would just add that there's, there's no element of Toolbox H that's um, being presented for action this evening. Uh, it was just an additional informational option that the city could consider moving forward that the consultants came up with and highlighted as a part of their overall package. And then with regards to the project, one thing that wasn't in the packet, but since the Planning Commission uh, reviewed the overall economic development strategy and uh, the CEQA document during the public comment period, the 45-day public comment period, uh, staff engaged with the Fish and Wildlife Service, submitted the project to them, and they've issued a no effect determination. So they've deemed the, the project before the commission to have no effect to biologic resources uh, managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and so I just staff wanted to highlight that. And obviously we will provide that to the city council when um, we present the item to them. Um, that came in last week from the service. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about Toolbox H? I had, I would ask for a clarification. Okay. I, I had a question. This is Sylvia. Yeah, go ahead, Sylvia. Now, is 
The way I'm looking at this toolbox, toolbox H, is this, are you kind of looking at this as a tool, like you said, that applicants and other people can use to determine what biological resources exist? And what kind of an upkeep would it be? It's not a one-time shot, especially like if CST and other resources migrate or move. Would this be something that would have to be updated every two years? Or I'm just trying to see long-term if this was implemented, what that would look like. So that's an excellent question. In preparation for bringing this matter to you in February at the workshop, we spent some time with a couple different biologists, particularly Monk and Associates, who had completed wetland delineations and assessment work throughout many of these properties. And what you're suggesting is absolutely true, that as new science is documented and registered, the picture can change. But there are basic, and that applies not only to species that are identified, but to wetland conditions and hydrology that can change over time. So I wouldn't call it a moving target, but it is one that does need to be updated periodically. Nevertheless, economic development is kind of a here and now issue. And to have a database with an understanding of those variables that can change over time, and perhaps have a mechanism for updating them, would serve the purpose of keeping us properly informed. I have a clarifying question on this. If we had this database and we had this information on some of the parcels that we're looking at, if something's found on there and we've deemed that it's under our database that it looks like there's no, say, CTS, and there is, are we liable for the information that we've given? Well, the information that's collected would be done by a Fish and Wildlife Service qualified biologist, and it is informational. So to the extent that that information is produced by a qualified biologist, it represents substantial evidence. But to the extent that a permit is required from one of the resource agencies, it still has to be vetted through those agencies. And so we would need to take care to qualify that information and to let folks know that when it comes time to actual permitting of a project, for example, the wetland delineations don't stand on their own. They require core verification. So it is a two-step process. Okay. This is Neil. I would say some of that should be stated right up front in the, you know, in the top of the document and the date of when it was actually performed. You know, I also understand that some of those activities, when done by a biologist, have to be done to certain protocols, which I don't know what they are, but you certainly can get somebody doing a study of something when they, it's the wrong time of year. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential underwater, you know, things that we just don't understand. And that should somehow be clearly stated up front, that it's just a, I know you put informational toolbox, but you've not actually been really clear about that the, any prospective owners would have to do their own investigation to verify what's there. Anyway, just my two cents. Yeah, this is Noah. All the comments that the commission have made are absolutely accurate and are fully supported by staff perspective. It's, this was kind of presented at a high level to gauge interest in the concept. And obviously if it were to be supported by the commission and city council for implementation, and then ultimately some budget put behind it, all of these issues would have to be vetted and these being highlighted are excellent points to the complexity of these potential processes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
hey, do we have any more questions on Toolbox H? No. Okay, we're going to move on to Toolbox I. So this is Dick Loki again. Toolbox I was added um, following some of the discussion that occurred at the, the Commission's workshop in February. And uh, in uh, your packets beginning on page 195, you'll see that the um, uh, purposes section of the zoning district um, for the, uh, should be, of the zoning districts was augmented to add language for the four downtown specific plan districts. That information came directly from the downtown specific plan. It was put into the code to make it complete. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on, on Toolbox I? All right. Hearing none, um, do we have any questions of staff or any any questions at all before I open up public hearing? No questions from me. Brittany? No questions. Sylvia? No, no. Steve? Not at this time, no. Okay. So I'm going to open this up for public hearing. I don't have my gavel, but here's my glass of water. Um, Lauren? Okay. Let's see. Uh, Jenny Blaker, do you have any uh, public comment?
give an update, legislative update about what's happening with this current situation. And it's going to be on Friday, April 17th, a virtual meeting. I think it's from 12 to 1, but I can send information to Lauren or someone that can distribute information if you want to be on the invitation list to, to listen in to the meeting. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And I wanted to welcome Sylvia as our new planning commissioner. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> I happened to bump into <laughs> Sylvia at another meeting, and um, so that was very nice. Before all this happened, when we were allowed to, just before we were stopped. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for for participating tonight, and um, I know it's got a few hiccups, but thank you. I think you did very well, Lisa. Thank you very much for conducting it. All Good right, well, thanks. And to the staff thank for you. Uh, yeah, getting it all moving. All right, then we are we are adjourned. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone.